Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are going to begin our Sahel panel. Before we get started, on behalf of the uh, Director General and the IOM staff, I would like to pay tribute to the civil and mi military uh, fatalities which took place, and uh, we would also like to extend our condolences to the victims. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it, it is an honor and a pleasure for me to moderate this high-level panel on mobility dynamics in the Sahel. As a stakeholder in our thematic discussions and the 110th session of the uh, IOM Member Council, allow me at the outset to uh, wish you a warm welcome as we uh, talk about such an important subject, which is uh, very much a current one. I would also like to welcome my IOM colleague who will be able to uh, give you an overview of the programs and IOM interventions in the region. Human mobility in Sahel uh, is part of an inter and extra African context and is is uh, multiversed. Uh, we must uh, paint a picture of this mobility dynamic in order to understand its causes and challenges. This discussion will allow us to uh, obtain food for thought in order to promote mobility which is safe, uh, orderly, and uh, human above all. As has been observed, uh, this mobility in, is linked to uh, rainy and agricultural seasonal migration, uh, transhumans, conflict-based displa displacement, climate insecurity, uh, seeking job opportunities, particularly in the mining industry, cotton plantations, fishing, travel for religious festivities, or simply tourism. This mobility is part of the labor-based migration in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly towards uh, Northern Africa and Europe. This panel is part of an effort to better understand the uh, challenges in terms of security, uh, uh, humanitarian emergencies, and uh, development. It will allow us to uh, review the resilience of the communities that are affected by the situation, particularly populations that are dealing with internal crises, uh, such as intercommunity violence, uh, terrorist attacks, and also climate changes. Natural catastrophes uh, are particularly concerning given the growing desertification of the re the region and the uh, drop in rainfall. These uh, concerns could help us to analyze migration and health as well, which is an, a major issue when we talk about the cyclical mobility of uh, populations uh, through the Sahel countries and outside of it. It will also be interesting to hear from the uh, approaches of regional partners such as the EU and the UN bodies in the IOM in particular regarding the cross body, uh, the cross border approach to be taken. I have the honor and the pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, those, uh, for example, to my left, Dodo Bourimi, who uh, has been in. Uh, in uh, animal husbandry organizations for uh, two decades, and he is a member of the uh, Bilateral Maccabi Network, uh, which is a recognized interlocutor for sub-regional organizations in Africa. It covers nine uh, countries in the sub-region, 75 uh, animal husbandry organizations, and has more than 500,000 members. And its actions benefit more around 2 million individuals. Then you have Dr. Buna Yatase, uh, who is a dentist and a, a surgeon uh, by trade, and is also the uh, Assistant Director General of the National Se Health Security Agency since 2016. He, is, uh, he manages the agency and is very much uh, imp involved in uh, taking strategic decisions on uh, epidemiological surveillance and uh, managing er emergencies. He uh, 
participated in managing the Ebola crisis in, in Guinea. Then we have uh, Mr. An- Angel Losada Fernandez, who requires no uh, introduction, who is the special representative of the EU in the Sahel. He is the special representative of the EU for Sahel since two- and has been since 2015. Before, he was the uh, rotating ambassador for the EU for Sahel uh, and the special envoyé to Lib- Libya between 2014 and 2015. Before he uh, joined the EU, he had a long career in Spanish diplomacy, where he held multiple positions in multiple countries. He holds a degree, f- a law degree from the University of Navarra, and also a degree in international studies from the Spanish Diplomatic Academy. Also, Mr. Richard Danzinger, uh, who is currently the uh, regional director for uh, West and Central Africa and IOM, and he has been since 2016. Before, he was in Afghanistan for three years as the head of mission. He greatly contributed to the Bali process on migrant traffic of migrants, uh, human trafficking, and associated cross-border crime. He was also a founding member of the uh, steering committee of the UN initiative to fight against uh, uh, human trafficking, UN GIFT, and also chair of the uh, World Economic Forum Committee on uh, Illicit Trade and Organized Crime. I would like to turn to Mr. Burema, who will talk to us about the impact of climate change on migration and mobility. Thank you very much, ma'am. Before I start, I would like to join my voice in recognizing all of the violence that has taken place in our sub-region and throughout the world and has victimized people. We would like to share our our condolences and our pain with the international community and everyone who is here. I see no need to uh, further introduce myself or my organization, seeing as they have already been introduced very well. I would like to explain why BMN exists, uh, or RBM rather, in French. It uh, was founded in 2004 because of a number of emerging challenges, namely the fact that national organizations realized that cross-border transhumans would not be able to be dealt with on just the level of one country, there had to be synergies created between multiple countries because they were all involved. And then uh, beyond that, climate change, which is a major theme of our discussion. Also, animal husbandry has always been the poor stepsister of our uh, of politics and our region policies. And also, youth. Generally, young people are disillusioned by the possibility of animal husbandry. And all of these challenges led to us creating RBM in 2004. So, so I will now... Uh, talk about the two major challenges we need to address today. The first is climate change, and the second is uh, safety and security in the area. So, climate change uh, has had a lasting effect uh, on um, animal husbandry in time and space, at least in West Africa. We've suffered a great deal and the effects can be seen through the degradation of natural resources. The growth of disease among uh, animals, uh, a decrease in productivity of uh, said animals, uh, increase in poverty among shepherds, and a reduced level of mobility. And that's because all of the strategic resources uh, are increasingly controlled by specific groups and individuals, which reduces mobility. To this phenomenon, we could add the following. How shall I put it? 
there is growing insecurity in the region, as you know full well. This affects the entire Sahel. And uh, this is probably going to last. These uh, two phenomena have uh, an enormous impact on the livelihoods of, of uh, local shepherds. In other words, they have uh, a reduced space for their activity, and agriculture gains ground. Uh, mobility is also hampered. Uh, natural resources are privatized. Uh, and all this increases uh, their vulnerability uh, to say nothing of internal conflicts. So, all this has led us uh, to take specific measures. At the national level, we try to strengthen the capacities of uh, our shepherds uh, so that they are knowledgeable in many facets of life. We try to promote uh, avoiding catastrophes by providing more information, promoting political dialogue, uh, and uh, we also try to manage potential food crises. Uh, at uh, a regional level, there are also uh, collaborative efforts. Uh, we also want to raise awareness with respect to conflicts in those contexts. We support uh, the initiatives that try to uh, give greater security uh, to uh, those who practice animal husbandry in the face of private companies. Uh, we also want to give them uh, greater security with respect to uh, the lands they use. Uh, and we also set up platforms to identify causes for potential conflicts uh, and uh, their resolution. We also carry out economic initiatives uh, that uh, try to include uh, young people. And we want to have a very comprehensive approach so that we have a systematic integration of uh, practices that can be sensitive to conflict resolution. That's all I can say in general terms. I'm very expectant with respect to your specific questions, because obviously I can't uh, address every single aspect uh, of uh, climate change, insecurity, uh, and the different partnerships we have uh, in uh, one single speech. So I'm definitely available to answer all of your questions. And I'm a, a man of action more than a man of theory in any case. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, presentation, which was extremely interesting. And I'm sure there will be many questions uh, later on. Uh, I'll give the floor now to Dr. Buna Yataseya. Mr. Buna, you have the floor. Thank you. So, I think that this panel might not be very familiar with health issues. So I'll try to focus on explaining how uh, migration relates to health in the context of the Sahel. But since my country uh, is not in the region, uh, I'll try to explain how there's a dynamic relationship between Guinea and Sahel, uh, and how the issue of health uh, uh, has an impact. So, Guinea is a West African country, uh, bordering on two Sahel countries, in other words, uh, Mali and Senegal. Uh, and we have access uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. And? Guinea, uh, is a mining rich country uh, and this favors internal migration. In this map, uh, you can see the migra migratory flows uh, that are strong both on the inside and the outside of the country. Uh, about 9 million people uh, uh, migrate uh, in this area, and an important proportion come from Sahel, uh, and Guinea is an important destination for them because of. Uh, mining. These uh, mining flows, uh, migratory flows, are also strong between Senegal and Mali. These are uh, Sahel countries. And in this uh, map, you'll see that Guinea is uh, clearly a country of origin for many migrants. And they use uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Morocco, Algeria, Libya even. And on the other side, you have Senegal and Mauritania all of which are Sahel countries. 
and these raise uh, health concerns. On this slide, you'll see that between uh, 2005 and uh, 2019, uh, over two, over almost uh, uh, 19,000 uh, individuals were repatriated. Uh, you'll see that uh, this is the basic migratory challenge, uh, and it uh, puts strain on an already weak health system. Our country, uh, uh, with Ebola, with between 2014 and 2016, uh, has also showed uh, the link between health and migration and its importance, because this uh, disease started from southern Guinea, then uh, expanded to the entire country because of internal migration, but then from Guinea, Ebola went on to Mali, in other words, the Sahel region, and then from Mali, uh, it went to Liberia, Sierra Leone, and from those countries, they went to Nigeria, and it continued expanding to the United States, forcing WHO uh, to uh, stated as an international health emergency. Now, what is the situation with respect to potential epidemic diseases in this country? We've known uh, cholera outbreaks uh, uh, at the end of the uh, last century, uh, since uh, up to 2012. Currently, uh, there are many migrations between Guinea and Benin. There are fishermen that uh, come to Guinea uh, to sell their fish. Uh, this uh, is an area that in general has a lot of migratory flows because of these resources. Uh, and there have also been outbreaks of meningitis uh, in uh, 2008. We actually had three of them. And with respect to yellow fever, we had uh, over 200 cases uh, 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 and often between Guinea and Mali and Guinea and Senegal. Uh, there are uh, a lot of, there's a lot of migration which also uh, carries other diseases. Now, with respect to uh, the prevalence of HIV AIDS, uh, we have uh, a prevalence rate of 10% uh, in general terms. Uh, and uh, the percentage increases if we're talking about those who carry out back and forth routes between these countries. And if we look at fishermen, we're talking about a 3.8% rate. Uh, and there's even a lower uh, rate uh, among those who work uh, in the mining sector. The most vulnerable sectors with respect to this disease uh, are uh, uh, small-scale mining uh, and traditional ports, these informal access points that attract a great uh, deal of migrants. With respect to universal health coverage, uh, poor access to basic health care uh, is characterized uh, uh, by uh, these things. We, have a, we don't have enough um, human resources, and much of our population, population lives underneath uh, the poverty threshold. Uh, this is especially the case in mining areas and those that are hard of access. Uh, so these informal access points are also a huge challenge in this regard. In the face of all this uh, today, uh, we're talking about Guinea as a country of origin. How ready is it? What is its level of preparedness in the face of future epidemics? Uh, and how can Guinea protect the entire South region? Uh, since it is a, a point of entry. So, the Ebola outbreak of 2014-2016 uh, led to creating a specialized structure uh, which uh, focuses on uh, health safety uh, and it set up an entire policy and system to be able to respond to health emergencies. Uh, it also uh, it developed a map of health risks and uh, the IOM has helped us a great deal, and we've also implemented the international uh, sanitary regulations, which is binding and clear and allows for a country to uh, protect itself as well as neighboring countries uh, with respect to health emergencies. Uh, we organize the surveillance efforts. Uh, we work with WHO uh, to have uh, integrated surveillance on these diseases so that we can surveil all potential epidemic diseases. Uh, and uh, when it comes to managing health emergencies, uh, today uh, in our 33 prefectures, uh, we've set up uh, specific and dedicated teams that can detect and respond quickly to health emergencies. We've also set up uh, emergency uh, 
uh, health uh, centers with the cooperation of IOM. Specialized teams have been rolled out, uh, and we have a team that focuses on uh, Ebola vaccines. Uh, but first and foremost, we've set up centers for epidemic treatment that can handle 25 cases at a time. When it comes to capacity building, uh, we've adopted three different approaches. In other words, we provide on-the-ground uh, training. We also work with uh, WHO guidelines uh, and specialized trainings. However, on the issue of cooperation with our different partners, I'd like to say the following. With Ebola, we had uh, 104 partners, and currently uh, we have WHO, CDC, uh, and uh, the IOM. What do we do specifically with the IOM? Well, during the Ebola outbreak, the IOM helped us a great deal when it comes to identifying the entry points for our country uh, and to establish a map of, of these entry points and helped us to set up a, a check system um, in these access points to be able to monitor the situation and eradicate all potential risks linked uh, to migration with other countries. Uh, Currently, there is a project to uh, strengthen health security uh, financed by the US CDC. Uh, here, uh, we want uh, to roll out uh, a roadmap uh, for health uh, safety. And you'll see that in this map, uh, Guinea has more than 43 access points, official access points, uh, that have been clearly identified by the IOM, uh, and uh, uh, they each have an evaluation of their needs, both in terms of human and infrastructure, and also looks at training wherewithal to see what a country has in uh, its uh, human capital to be able to broach issues of migration. This has allowed us, uh, hand in hand with the external evaluation that was carried out, to find out clearly what can be done with respect to migration and these challenges. Next, we have another project, uh, still with uh, the IOM. Uh, it's uh, the second project that's linked with uh, ECO. And here we try to work together with the IM and other uh, agencies, which allows us to identify vulnerable areas in Forcaria Prefecture uh, and in those prefectures bordering with Mali, which is a Sahel country, to see which are the most vulnerable areas uh, and how health issues can be broached at that level, both uh, for the populations that are local inhabitants as well as uh, migrant populations. And this is financed also with the European Union support. Uh, it's an ongoing project and it has allowed us uh, to mobilize local populations to be able to respond to their health needs. Again, both uh, the needs of residents and migrant populations. This is one of the most active borders our country has. Uh, we have about 500 people uh, a day that leave uh, the Sigurdin Prefecture to go to Mali and uh, come back. So there's a lot of comings and goings. Uh, there's also another project that I'd like to mention that's also uh, supported by the EU. It's called a pre-plan. When it comes to health emergencies, you, only, you shouldn't only focus on health. You also need to look at how the law is implemented. The IOM also focuses on this. It's precisely to see how uh, the law is implemented and uh, how uh, they have an impact on health emergencies and issues related to migration on all legal facets uh, of the matter. There's another project uh, with uh, the Global Fund uh, that looks at the lorry drivers that uh, carry loads from one country to another, and also we look at health workers when it, in the context of tuberculosis and HIV. Uh. So, migration and health uh, are closely linked uh, issues, uh, and uh, together with the IOM, uh, we're doing some outstanding work. We did this uh, during the Ebola outbreak. Uh, the IOM helped us a great deal to manage the challenge of migration, and right now it's also accompanying our country uh, so that we can have uh, all the skills necessary uh, and so that we can bear in mind the link between migration and health. There are still a few challenges uh, ahead of us. The IOM has done a great deal during the Ebola outbreak, and now we need to see how all this uh, can be maintained over time. And we also need to see how we can align ourselves with our partners and how structures can streamline projects. Because if you talk about managing the return of migrants, we're talking about uh, uh, over well, 
hundreds of people, and now the IOM is doing some work, but what's going to happen once the IOM steps back? How will the state take ownership of these structures? How are we going to integrate these issues, the position of these migrants in our national policies? There's also a health, a health challenge of the broad South region, which remains uh, current. We need to uh, have an eye on how migratory matters link to health. It's a major challenge for all the countries in the region. And in the end, what we really want is uh, uh, some level of continued follow-up from the IOM, especially in these 43 access points, uh, two of which uh, represent about 80% of migratory flows between Guinea and the South countries, which are Senegal and Mali. This would also cover technical training, but, but especially we do need a level of national ownership of the issue of migration and the ancillary health issues. This is the ongoing challenge. To conclude, we'd like to say that migration is very much close, uh, closely related to health. We need to address these two issues hand in hand uh, because a migrant that leaves one country uh, will uh, have to cross several other countries in the South region and the South region is now uh, a conveyor belt practically towards Europe. Uh, this is an essential point that needs to be addressed both for the migrants traveling and local populations. And these migrants that are afterwards going back uh, to the countries later on also require specific protection during their trip. Uh, and once they return, they need a certain effort with respect to uh, integration so they're not stigmatized. And they also need uh, psychological support uh, because their goal was to go to Europe, and if they did not achieve that goal, the return can be quite traumatic. I want to see how we can address these issues. All of these issues are extremely important when it comes to migration and health. So, as I've said, health, migration in the South region. As I've said before, Guinea is not a South country, but we are at its doorstep, uh, and therefore insecurity in the South region, mobility in the South region uh, will definitely have a knock-on effect in our country, especially with respect to health issues. And uh, since Guinea has uh, certain diseases that have uh, the potential to be um, to become academics, uh, we need to uh, make sure that health uh, issues in Guinea are broached so as to best protect the Sahel region. That is all I have to say for now. I am uh, here available to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Buna, for that exhaustive report. I uh, agree with you completely when you said that we need an interdisciplinary approach, uh, especially when you're talking about uh, health emergencies. Uh, it's uh, not just uh, a health uh, issue. We also need to look at uh, legislation and other regulatory aspects. Now I'd like to give the floor to the ambassador who will share his comments uh, on the European Union's work in this context. Thank you. So, first and foremost, I'd like to uh, join uh, my voice to all of yours, uh, presenting my condolences to France uh, and to all countries uh, who have lost uh, loved ones uh, in Sahel, uh, which uh, is a land uh, that suffers increasing levels of insecurity. I also wanted to thank you for the opportunity you've offered me today, uh, the opportunity to, to join you. I also want to thank uh, the DG for his outstanding work uh, and the ongoing work he does. Uh, and I think that migration is essential. I always say the following, the history of uh, humanity is ultimately the history of migration. So I'd like to focus on three points. Some of these I've already mentioned. First of all, I'd like to carry out a general evaluation of the situation in which we, uh, which exists in Sahel. Then I'll talk about what uh, the EU does in that context. And uh, thirdly, uh, I'll talk about cooperation between the EU uh, and the IOM. And I'll wrap up very quickly by addressing a few key uh, um, issues that need to be addressed. And then I'll answer your questions with great pleasure. So, first topic. Uh, the general situation in the Sahel region. In the Sahel region, 
There are many different countries, and the European Union focuses on five of these countries. Sahel is broader than this, but we focus on five countries, which uh, some of them are countries of origin, others are countries of origin and of transit, and others are mostly transit countries. Uh, if we're talking about Mauritania, it's, uh, it's on the receiving end, because uh, it receives uh, a lot of migrants. Sadly, Sahel is an area of crisis. Sadly, you can find all possible crises under the sun, and this obviously has a direct impact on migration. There is first and foremost a political crisis, a clear political crisis. The peace process in Mali is uh, at a dead end. I'll be traveling there shortly. There's issue of refugees, refugee camps, and so forth, pursuant to the uh, conflict in Mali. That's the first one. Then there's a crisis of governance. Uh, because there is a, a, a authority vacuum. I always say that uh, this sort of vacuum is the lifeblood of terrorism because a state is not present uh, to uh, implement the rule of law and local inhabitants are vulnerable to uh, terrorists. And there's also a crisis of radicalization. And then there's a security crisis as well. The security crisis uh, comes from northern Mali, starting from the Mali uh, crisis uh, that uh, was intervened in with Serval. Afterwards, this crisis went to the center of the country, and now it's taking on Burkina Faso and has a direct impact on the entire uh, Gulf of Guinea. So we're talking about a crisis that is spreading like uh, a cancer. And then there's another component to this equation, which isn't really a crisis, but would explain crises, crises and that was very well explained by Mr. Boima, and that's this issue of uh, climate change. We need to add to this issue uh, the demographic explosion that occurs in the region. So, on the one hand, we have climate change, which means that there's less arable land and a harder time for uh, farmers and shepherds. But at the same time, there's a demographic explosion with a, a large population of young people that looked to a good future, wants a good future, and I can't find it in these conditions. And. Uh, as a consequence of all this, we have a terrible humanitarian crisis that affects about 7 million people. Just a few days ago, I went there with a special representative of the Secretary General Chambas uh, and uh, the special representative of the SG uh, FAL uh, from Guinea, with whom I have a very close relationship. We went uh, to the four countries on the basin of uh, Lake Chad. Uh, we visited populations that had been completely decimated by Boko Haram with uh, um, terrible consequences. So we're really facing a humanitarian uh, crisis that affects more than 7 million people in this area. Now, obviously, to try to explain all this, first and foremost, as I said at the outset, uh, we need to recognize that uh, Sahel is basically a land of transit. This region has always been an area of transit, of cultures, of, uh, of wealth. Uh, and so forth. Uh, adding to all this, the Libyan crisis has uh, uh, complicated things even further. This crisis has had uh, consequences on migration. Uh, when it comes to the migration that went from Mali, that went to Libya to work and then returned, now they no longer have that option. Uh, the challenges of the Libyan peace process uh, also complicate things. Uh, and all of this basically means that the Sahel region is in a situation of a constant crisis with increasing insecurity. This is a very uh, um, general definition of the situation, but it definitely affects migration. So that's the first issue I wanted to address. The second is, what does the EU do in the face of the situation? Well, in uh, 2011, the EU was the first uh, to set up a Sahel strategy. Now we have 17 or 18. And the advantage of the strategy is that uh, it was a precursor to the events in Mali, which shows a certain amount of foresight since it happened before those events. Sécurité et développement. Il n'y a pas de sécurité sans développement, pas de développement sans sécurité. Ce qui aujourd'hui est en plus. You can't have one without the other, which is broadly accepted. Nowadays, but at the time, it was not so clear. It's very, it's all well and good to have a strategy, uh, 
that covers the five countries that are in the G5, Mauritania, Mali, Na Mali Burkina Faso, Niger, and Chad. But a strategy like that is not, by in and of itself, is not sufficient. So in 2015, the EU drafted its regional action plan. This regional action plan uh, was uh, to try to promote uh, the uh, a resolution to the situation in the region. So we're facing a very complex issue because this regional plan in, uh, that was adopted in 2015 established four clear priorities. Uh, we wanted to fight against ra radicalization, the issue of youth, which is absolutely essential, um, the challenge of migration, which uh, appeared at the time already, and last but not least, the issue of security and border checks. Uh, these are the four major issues of the regional action uh, plan. And we're going back to the same. It's all well and good to have a strategy. Uh, it's wonderful to have a regional action plan, but but we need financing and institutions that can carry it out. And at the time when we were pretty much adopting the plan, there was this enormous migratory crisis with these terrible images that we all saw, children dying on the beach and so forth. The European Union had to, to shoulder its responsibilities. It did so, and it called its uh, valid conference. Uh, this conference uh, had and still has as its mission to fight against the deep-rooted causes of migration. And what are these causes, you might ask? Uh, it's what I mentioned at the outset. All these crises, all these conflicts uh, that have a direct and indirect pack impact uh, on migration. Um, at, the, at the valid conference, we adopted a plan uh, and we based ourselves on five pillars. Uh, what are these five pillars? The first, as I already mentioned, was to attack the deep roots of migration. Uh, and this is basically everything. It involves development, resilience, and everything. Uh, the second point is uh, to strengthen cooperation on migratory matters on a, reg on a constant basis. In other words, to develop uh, legal avenues to address these problems. Like I said at the outset, the history of uh, mankind is a history of uh, migration, so we need to regulate it in some way. And the third point uh, was obviously to strengthen protection provided to migrants and refugees. Fourth point uh, is the fight against illegal immigration and human trafficking, uh, because here clearly there is a shared responsibility that the authorities need to share, um, authorities in the Sahel that should abandon their populations in the desert. We have uh, some data which is rather hard to come by, I have to say, and it's absolutely terrible to see uh, how people die in the desert abandoned by their traffickers. I was in the north in Madama meeting refugees that are living in absolutely horrendous uh, conditions uh, in every sense of the word. And f fifth uh, and last point, uh, improve cooperation when it comes to returning and reintegrating and the reintegration of migrants. This is a very political and very sensitive issue, but this issue of returns is also something that was on the table. So, it is wonderful to have all of these strategies and ideas, but we need instruments to implement them. And in the EU, we have been quite innovative. We knew that the EU and all big organizations in general have instruments which can be quite cumbersome and difficult to implement. And in Palette, we decided to create a trust fund which would be fast acting and flexible and really be adapted to the countries that are suffering so that they can uh, take ownership and it can have a direct and immediate impact and so the trust fund which has around four thousand four point five million uh, euros uh, uh, contributed uh, by EU member states and others it has 210 programs for four billion euros of which two billion goes to the Sahel because there is the Maghreb aspect, there's the Sahel aspect, and the uh, corn of the Horn of Africa, rather. These are the uh, three tiers of the program. And as I said uh, last November 19th, uh, those were the number of projects we had uh, in tandem with our partners in the steering committee that I am in. We 
discuss with the partners to find out what their needs are in terms of uh, funding. And three aspects are at the heart of our work to fight against uh, uh, instability, strengthening uh, the capacity of our partners, and in this overall integrated approach to the situation, maximize the impact of migration on development. So these are the actions that the EU are, is carrying out uh, in reaction to the situation on the ground. Now I would like to highlight the relationship between the EU and the IOM. Operationally, the EU acts with its member states and is uh, certainly the highest contributor to the IOM budget between 2015 and 2018. I believe the EU Commission gave around 420 uh, projects to the IMO with a value of 400 uh, or rather 4 billion uh, euros. This is the initiative that we have with uh, with the IOM for the Sahel in order to protect migrants. This is something that we mentioned when we talked about the Malian uh, uh, crisis, but there is a political aspect as well that is also to be taken into account in the analysis. These activities were uh, funded through the uh, Trust Fund. It is the first global program that brings together uh, the uh, Chad uh, Basin, the uh, Horn, uh, North Africa, and the Sahel region. I think it is very positive. I uh, went to the region uh, myself in order to see the effects of the project. It is a very important project, and I would just like to say how satisfied I am and how thankful I am to this organization for the role that it's paid in this initiative. Because from May 2017 to uh, September 2019, we supported the voluntary return of 603,000 people from Niger, Mali, uh, Libya, uh, Mauritania, and Djibouti. We have offered assistance on the ground to more than 200,000 migrants whose return was supported by the trust fund and other means. So when you are fighting against a human problem, a humanitarian problem, we are dealing with something that affects all of us because security is not just the issue of the person who has been victimized, but the security of of Europe depends on the security of Sahel, and Sahel's security depends on everyone else's security. We are in a world where migration is one of the best examples of this interrelation. In the uh, Chad Lake region, we uh, were directly involved. As I said, I've been in the Chad uh, base, and I was there not that long ago. And a challenge posed by the refugees who were there. There were two issues, uh, two questions that they asked about uh, education, particularly for women. Gender is key because they are the ones who raise children, who fight against uh, radicalizing their children. Education is key in that regard. You said we're ignorant. That's why Boko Haram was able to be so successful there. And secondly, and this is quite extraordinary, they could say water, uh, electricity. They said we want documents. We want to be registered. So once again, the importance of the state infrastructure. And I just want to conclude on a few brief remarks. I think that there are three challenges that we are going to face. The first one is doubtlessly the uh, emergency. We must act now. The situation is unsustainable. We see that every day. Second point, coordination. This is fundamental, and I'm pleased by the coordination between the IOM and the EU. but. With 17 strategies operating right now in the region, we are dealing with a very complex situation and we need to coordinate. And thirdly, 
which we can talk about uh, later if you want, is ownership. There really has to be ownership on the part of the Sahelian states. I think this is uh, the last day as uh, as high representative uh, after the uh, parliament vote, the EU parliament vote uh, yesterday. We are not here to work uh, for Africa. We are here to work with Africa. And it is in that same spirit that the new representative, Joseph Bure, will uh, carry out his mission, as he said during his hearings in the European Parliament. He will focus on Africa and the Sahel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for that exhaustive review and analysis of the uh, activities of the European Union in the region. You mentioned two important issues, education and the uh, civil registry of the population. This is something that is indeed important for all uh, uh, development initiatives. I am going to give the floor to Mr. Denzinger, who will give us an overview of the IOM programs in the region. Thank you very much. It is truly a pleasure to uh, share this uh, this uh, table with uh, my new partner uh, from the EUG, as well as the uh, EU, the uh, Animal Husbandry for uh, Foundation, as well as the uh, National Health Security Agency. I will start by giving an overview of the situation in the Sahel. Uh, many have already spoken. I will go through a few guiding principles of our actions and also mention a few activities. But first of all, what is the Sahel? Everyone has their own definition. Some of them think of the G5, G5 plus the Chad Lake. For the strate UN strategy, it's G5 plus 5 because they're the two subregions that I mentioned and they add Senegal and Guinea and Gambia. Regarding our work in the IOM, we talk about parts of countries that face similar challenges and which are mostly between the desert and the forest. That is m for the working definition that we use in the IOM. I will also say the uh, that Sahel is a, a land of opportunities which are not being uh, t harnessed right now, but there is a potential of 14 kilowatts per hour per year in energy. There are natural resources, mm, aquifers. We talk about uh, demographic dividend. Uh, the majority of the population is uh, young many under 15 years of age. That being said, there is a major challenge with climate change. This is something that has been mentioned already. Uh, demographic dividends are all very well and good, but before you come to the dividends part, you have to have jobs. You have to have sources of income for these young people. The uh, rise of violent extremism which finds perfect nesting grounds in the Sahel in order to grow and radicalize young people. Weak governance in remote uh, areas, uh, a vacuum of state uh, authority, and also coordination. The Sahel was always a crossroads. It was always a place of transit. And now there are 18 strategies, I believe. And more than a few special envoyés, there are two special representatives of the Secretary General, two or several high representatives, two economic communities without mentioning the other regional organizations such as the, the uh, Lake Chad uh, Commission. There was a... Uh, 
UN Security Resolution in 2013, we developed an integrated strategy under the leadership of uh, Manami Mohammed. We were able to recalibrate in two years uh, in consultation with other with the member states. Just very briefly, the six objectives will be of no surprise after the uh, presentations, uh, cross-border cooperation, uh, peacekeeping, uh, uh, inclusive growth, uh, climate adaptation, and renewable uh, energy, and also uh, gender equality. So these are together there. And there's also resilience, governance, and security. Two years ago, we revamped this strategy, and many organizations wanted to add migration to the issue. We were actually against this because migration is absolutely cross-cutting. It affects all of the uh, pillars. It is instrumental to both the causes and the effects of each pillar, and so including it made no sense to us. So this UN strategy is a framework for IOM work. Uh, this is the case for the uh, SDGs and the 2030 agenda, but we focus very much on the fact that we are working in the UN for collective results for us and for the member states. And so our approach in the region, I think, can be summarized through four main uh, 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 principles, uh, humanitarian nexus, peace, and development. An example of this from the uh, north of Niger, Niger, is that we are attempting to carry out protection with uh, those who have fled Libya with help or without it, but we are trying to create resilience so that development has a basis to develop. In other words, we work with the uh, communities uh, along with the mm, 10,000 or so uh, uh, West Africans who are working in that area. Also, we focused on border areas. This is a basis of our of the UN strategy, but here in the International Organization of Migrations, well, that is a major crossing point for migrants. Uh, this is where the state is the most absent, and as a result, fewer services. When you often have a young population who is uh, alienated, they feel marginalized, and thus it is really a perfect storm for extremist groups. The fact that there is a population that feels neglected makes other fundamental principles that much more important, namely transparency and inclusion and in the way that we work and in being fully accountable for our actions. And when I say inclusiveness, I'm not talking about animal uh, husbandry, uh, uh, shepherds, uh, but also local authorities, international agencies sometimes meet just with the communities and individual beneficiaries. I, we think it is important to show that a state exists and that it is represented by regional or local organizations. And I think that in the cross-border areas, an agency such as the IOM can offer an added value. 
The fact that we are present throughout the Sahel, throughout our work with Mr. Burima, for example, the uh, Shepherds Association, we work with uh, the uh, governments of the local Gurma and the local authorities, obviously, in order to address the border issues. Climate change must always be in the back of our minds or in the front of our minds, along with the sensitivity to conflict, which we must be aware of in all of our activities. If we do not take due account of the development of this or that program or project, if we do not take account of this issue, sustainability is called into question along with peace and stability. It is so important to make sure that we do not further marginalize populations in the areas that we work. Furthermore, the importance of using evidence-based methods when it comes to collection of data on mobility in West Africa. All of that information is ne necessary, be it due to conflict-based uh, displacement or, or migratory flows from south, east, or west. 90% of migration of uh, ECOWAS uh, citizens is within the ECOWAS area. And finally, we have to see if it is the best uh, time for people to go back to areas where there has been insecurity, and security is an issue. And also, we will very much support the migratory uh, observatories in Africa, such as, for example, in Morocco and Bamako. There will be seven uh, weeks of a visit to uh, Bamako to see this. Also, protection and assistance to migrants. This is something that the ambassador talked about. Many of these activities were allowed through the EU Trust Fund, but I would just underscore that the African Union created a task force in tandem with the uh, uh, United Nations and the IOM in order to have a snapshot of the situation and to understand those who are in dangerous situations in uh, the desert in Africa and further on at sea. I do not want to talk that much about our strictly humanitarian work. It is coordination and the in the camps. Uh, we uh, do that work in the region just as we do elsewhere. But what we consider to be most important is the basic uh, assistance to migrants. You spoke of uh, more than 300,000. A major part of uh, reintegration is social and psychosocial reintegration beyond just the health uh, care work. We see that psychosocial and social work is a big uh, weak point uh, in the systems. This is something that we are trying to address in Niger. We help the the health ministry to reestablish the uh, psychiatric service in the uh, hospital. Now, with all of these migrants uh, moving back and forth, there must be appropriate conditions for them to work because it is a, a migration that takes place in search of work, but there are people who do not want to leave their homes. And so creating job opportunities is a key point for us in all of the areas where there is a great deal of mobility. I will not bore you with the details of the programs, but we work very much with uh, young people and we have not forgotten women either. We uh, have a Boko Haram initiative uh, but 
in tandem with uh, one of the countries in, in, in the Chad region. And finally, social cohesion, which is something that I referred to before. The importance of not just ensuring that peace remains where there is peace, but also to build peace where it is lacking, but also put communities together with the uh, state authorities, the local authorities, in order to build trust, to rebuild trust, take baby steps towards rebuilding the uh, state's authorities, authority in remote areas. And the last pillar of our work is supporting safe, regular migration. And this is something that we do interinstitutionally with the ECO with ECOWAS, uh, the uh, G5 and Sahel and other organizations, as well as member states themselves. Just one example that we have been working on for years uh, with the support of uh, the EU and with ECOWAS is to implement the the uh, free movement initiative in ECOWAS, a common visa for their member states. We are trying to help disseminate regulations on transhumans because we know that this is something that ECOWAS is interested in. So by way of conclusion, I would just leave you with a few ideas which are important and give us a framework to understand the work that we do in the region. Firstly, yes, this is an emergency. Yes, we must bear in mind the peace, development, human nexus, but there must be long-term objectives as well. 2060, uh, 2053 is a key uh, date. A lot of these problems will not be solved in five years, and we keep in mind the aspirations of uh, the African Union and the countries. Also, it is not just an issue of migration and mobility, but also peace and stability. There must be fewer inequalities between regions and uh, even on a continental level, but that's another issue. And finally, the environment, climate change, I do not believe there is a um, another region in the world where all of these aspects come together. And I hope we will talk a lot about the Sahel at the COP25 in Madrid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. I have nothing to add to what you said. Uh, you had a very valuable uh, experience and, and this expertise. I see that we barely have five minutes left, and I would like to uh, open the floor for uh, any comments or questions from the audience on the subjects that we were just informed about. You have the floor. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and thank you to our panelists. In light of today's panel, we at the International Catholic Migration Commission would like to highlight pressing operational realities reported by our ICMC deployment scheme field colleagues in Niger. We are encountering an increasing caseload of children migrating alone from the Horn of Africa who have suffered horrific abuse, including torture and rape by traffickers. For example, one ICMC deployee recounted the case of a boy who had been tortured by traffickers and wound up in a Lib Libyan detention center. The traffickers forced him to call up his mother to pay a ransom for his release. And while on the telephone, the traffickers began to torture him again so that his mother could hear 
her son's screams. His mother, a widow with extremely limited resources, was forced to sell her house to raise funds for the ransom, but the sales proceeds weren't enough. So she had to start begging. However, through the emergency transit mechanism, a partnership between IOM and UNHCR, the boy was rescued in Libya and brought to Niger, where our ICMC deployees received him for resettlement processing. You know, this is good, but given the number of children we're seeing, more resettlement places need to be allocated to them. We call states to increase resettlement places and addition, offer complementary pathways, including family re reunification, prioritizing cases for unaccompanied children from the emergency transit mechanisms in both Niger and Rwanda. And as I understand recently, um, new flights have just arrived in Rwanda. In resettling unaccompanied minors, we have seen how giving them a new start on life brings life to and creates connections in the host community. Natalie, a foster mother in Salt Lake City, USA, having resettled Tedros and Jerusalem, two Eritrean children from the Niger Emergency Transit Mechanism, reflects that this experience has been amazing and I receive a lot of support. These kids are incredible and having them with me brings meaning to my life. I absolutely recommend this experience to anyone. We at ICMC know that resettlement is a life-saving protection mechanism that works. And indeed, we are encouraged by the new IOM UNHCR CRISP in initiative, which seeks to expand the base of resettlement countries by supporting emergency states, excuse me, by supporting emerging states to begin resettlement programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to give the distinguished delegate of Japan the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam. Uh, Japan takes problems happening in regional uh, Sahel region seriously and puts importance on the security and the stability of this region. In August uh, 2019, Japan hosted Tokyo International Conference for African Development 7. In the conference, Japan hosted a special, special session for peace and stability in Sahel region and announced its intention to provide following assistances with the close cooperation with international partners such as IOM in the region. One, uh, capacity development for 1,000 officers in justice, administration, and legislative sectors in coming three years. Two, vocational training and education, especially for youth. And three, support host community of migrants and IDPs in the context of humanitarian nexus. Japan will closely uh, uh, Japan will work closely with IOM and other organizations for the implementation, implementation of this project with close cooperation of countries in the region. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. I recognize the ambassador from the European Union. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will speak uh, on behalf of the European Union and its member states. Um, let me say that migration movements in the region uh, are a long-standing phenomenon and, and an inter integral part of West African societies. There are indeed substantial migration populations that reside in many countries of the region. Many often move just seasonally, seasonally, seasonally but most importantly, these migration movements are first and foremost intra-regional with almost 80 to 90% of all migrants moving within West Africa. The Sahel and the Lake Chad uh, region face many challenges linked to poverty, to lack of stability, economic fragility. This is further exacerbated by climate change in a region where more than 80% of the population relies essentially on agricultural and pastoral activities. Trafficking in human beings, smuggling of migrants, together with other illicit trafficking activities are embedded in what is indeed a sort of a functioning informal economy. 
So we need to increase our efforts to disrupt the, bus the business model of the traffickers. Conflict and security challenges are increasingly also linked to non-state armed groups attacking civilians, and they are also causing many displacements, both internal and across the borders, and led to spillover effects in the neighboring countries. The European Union and the IOM have been working in partnership in the Sahel for many years, covering humanitarian interventions, assisted voluntary returns and reintegration, capacity building in migration-related aspects of state and non-state actors' activities, and migration governance, such as strengthening migration data and communication on migratory movements. Following the Valletta Summit on Migration, the EU has established the EU Emergency Trust Fund for Africa to help address the root causes of instability, of forced displacement and of irregular migration. And IOM is indeed a major partner in the implementation of the actions under the fund. I mean, the actions under the fund come also on top of long-standing development aid provided to the European Development Fund. The Sahel and the Lake Child region benefit from over more than 100 programs for a total from up to 1.9 billion euros from the European Union institutions, member states and other donors. Just to mention another example, uh, the Joint Initiative for Migration Protection and Reintegration by the European Union and IOM have supported or has supported African partners' efforts and actions enabling to rescue indeed 23,000 uh, stranded migrants. And we've heard indeed there are terrible stories happening in the desert. But also to help uh, the voluntary return and reintegration of over 68,000 migrants in the Sahel returning from Libya and, and, and Niger. To provide a common response to major cross-border threats and regional development needs, the EU and its member states are uh, continue and are committed to support the efforts of the G5 Sahel countries, uh, Niger, Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali and Mauritania, and of course of the whole of the Sahel region. And we will continue to continue our support and cooperation at the regional and national level. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I see there are no further requests for the floor. Therefore, I uh, might give the floor for observations from members of the panel. Well, uh, I think that pastoral activity, uh, animal husbandry and so forth might not be uh, um, the most hot or well-known of topics. I just want to re-emphasize that uh, migration in the sub-region uh, is uh, uh, an extremely important issue and there is a certain amount of complementarity between the countries of the south and the countries of the Sahel region. Those that are in the south have a greater rainfall than those uh, in the Sahel region. Climate change and uh, Governance challenges uh, are uh, are a key part of the issues at hand. Uh, in the past, in countries such as Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and so forth, uh, there was uh, room for migration in this context. Uh, uh, this uh, pastoralist uh, migration is not really seasonal migration, but. Uh, it also explains the complementarity between different ecosystems between the northern Sahel uh, region uh, and the countries uh, south. Because in the winter, uh, uh, animals uh, go to the north, and in the dry season, uh, they go southwards. With uh, the increase of poverty, uh, Farmers have lost their uh, livestock, uh, and now uh, we see that uh, pastoralists represent about 7% of the migrants that uh, travel northward. And this is a new trend because in the past, uh, during the low seasons for different uh, strategic reasons to support their families, uh, uh, used to... Um, Go. They also went to ur urban areas in the dry season to uh, get an extra income for their families. That way they also put less pressure on their animals. 
However, all this poverty and uh, poor governance has had serious repercussions. And uh, uh, animal husbandry has often been on the sidelines of policymakers, and that is why today uh, uh, these uh, shepherds and other pastoralists are both victims and also actors in this uh, um, theater of insecurity. So, yes, there are problems that are linked to the problems of youth because these young people can no longer remain at this level of poverty just like uh, their elders did. And therefore, they attempt, they dare, they uh, try uh, to uh, find better horizons, better options. And so, uh, over the past uh, years, uh, many initiatives have gone forward uh, Many initiatives aimed uh, at uh, um, the issue of animal husbandry, and I think that the European Union has raised this, and among the EU programs, there are, yes, it's true, uh, programs that uh, specifically uh, 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 address uh, pastoralist activity. The World Bank also developed the PREPS effort in the sub-region, um, and uh, now we have uh, the IOM that's also taking... Uh, a lively interest to this uh, uh, population because this is part of the solution of the problem we have at a uh, between communities that's really where the the issue is and that's all I would like to say at this stage we have obviously other partners that are interested and contributing uh, but uh, and yes, there are definitely are initiatives uh, to address animal husbandry, but in practice, it's still uh, quite difficult uh, for uh, the average uh, uh, farmer to uh, engage. Well, in any case, I want to uh, uh, tell you that there is uh, one person that knows what it is to be uh, uh, involved in animal husbandry because I'm the daughter of, uh, of uh, somebody working in that sector. Yes, uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. Quickly, I'd like to mention three issues. The first has to do with uh, pastoral activity. The situation in the region is very complex. Uh, there is uh, pastoralism and its link to agriculture uh, and the uh, uh, challenge at the level of relations between communities. I don't want to talk about relations between ethnicities because the use those labels would be to play into the hand of those who try to use those sort of divisions in society. But if you look at uh, that approach this way, it's very important, as I said, to bear in mind the role of the state, the presence of the state. For example, we know full well that uh, Amado Kufa of Katasima Manina had uh, organized himself for uh, um, uh, shepherds to transit Niger and basically to do what the state should have done. In other words, there is a substitution uh, uh, that replaces the state, uh, the extreme radical groups replace the state, uh, and that is how they win the hearts and minds of populations, by doing what the state should do, entering in these vacuums that I mentioned earlier. So we need to strengthen the role of the state uh, and the presence of the state, and that's difficult because we're talking about weak states with weak administrations and limited resources. But we stand shoulder to shoulder uh, and uh, by their side. The next issue I wanted to mention uh, has to do with uh, EU activities. The ambassador has already mentioned this, and uh, I myself refer to the Trust Fund and so forth. The European Union is fully committed with all of its institutions. I could mention the following example. We have uh, ECAP for Niger. It has set up uh, antennae in Agadez, uh, which is a hub for migration. And from that point, hand in hand with uh, the government of Niger and with uh, the measures uh, uh, deployed by ECAP, uh, we practically have no uh, more illegal uh, migrants or, or human trafficking in this uh, area, in this corridor of the central Mediterranean, which I always say comes up from Libya like a highway. Obviously, it's got its uh, tolls along the road, and that was mentioned earlier by a uh, previous speaker. 
these are uh, humanitarian crises that uh, we cannot put up with. We've seen ourselves how people are mutilated, and on top of that, they're being held ransom. Uh, so there is this highway, essentially, and the European Union has acted strongly in that regard. And third and last point that I wanted to highlight is the issue of the importance of coordinating efforts and cooperation. And I want to tip my hat once again to the IOM and its work with the European Union. That's an excellent effort of cooperation. Richard? Thank you. Three quick points on my side. So when we tell people that uh, our monitoring of migratory flows includes uh, flocks of uh, animals, some people might smile, but we are dead serious. We monitor these uh, flocks, uh, and uh, it allows us to set up uh, with uh, Mr. Burma's organizations, early warning systems uh, there where we see that there are going to be uh, uh, tensions and uh, outbreaks between uh, uh, farmers and shepherds, uh, and we try to activate their traditional conflict resolution systems. Secondly, I want to take advantage of this opportunity to thank the Japanese government for all its support to the region and to the IOM at large. Uh, most recently, we could mention this great program for employment of young people in Sierra Leone. And uh, since the state of these Northern African migrants was mentioned, I'd like to say the following. All the members present can rest assured that we do everything in our power to work closely um, with uh, the Red Cross uh, and Red Crescent Movement for this issue. We uh, met with a special re representative uh, for uh, the region and also in the Northern Mediterranean, well, um, Western Mediterranean and West Africa to see if there could be room for improvement. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Richard. Thank you, Richard. So I think we're coming to the end of this panel segment. There could have been uh, more questions, I guess. But just to wrap things up, I myself wanted to express how important coordination is and also to have a consistent perspective and approach in the region. As far as the IOM is concerned, I think we just start to by being uh, consistent in our strategies, uh, whether it be uh, approaching uh, uh, things from an environmental angle, from a health angle, uh, and so on and so forth. Everything needs to be hand-in-hand -hand with UN development programs uh, and other uh, regional efforts and policies. So I think uh, these uh, all need to work hand-in-hand, -hand, uh, and uh, we need to have an approach that uh, espouses uh, the modern UN approach, which asks for coherence uh, and consistency. So please join me in thanking the panel in a worthy way. Thank you.